I'd like to introduce our speaker. Her name is Anai Villadrich. She's a sociologist and medical anthropologist originally from Argentina, where she developed an early scholarly career on gender and reproductive health. Once in the United States, she received a master's degree in sociology with honors from the New School University, a master's degree in philosophy, and a PhD in sociomedical sciences, specializing in medical anthropology from Columbia University, awarded with distinction, and the Marissa De Castro Benton Award in 2003. Villadrich is currently an associate professor in the departments of sociology and anthropology at Queens College and the director of public health, the director of the public health program at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Villadrich's main research focus intertwines the field of immigration, culture, gender, and health. Among her latest projects, she studies the impact of health disparities on Latinos' diets through the lens of their cultural traditions, for example, nostalgic foods in the United States. So with that, we welcome you. Thank you, everyone, for having me here. And I, I, I can say this is a very interdisciplinary group. I want to thank uh, Dr. Pixie Ferris for really making this possible. Uh, so via my friend and colleague, Elena Savogal, who re really inspired my coming here, and of course, all the departments. I'm not going to mention the, you know, the School of Public Health, Sociology, Communication, Women's Studies, but all of you are doing fabulous work, and I'm very pleased and honored to be here. I'm going to be talking for our, about half an hour to 40 minutes. If I see people falling asleep or getting bored, I may actually ask questions to the audience. I always say that the good thing about food is that everyone eats. Nobody gets bored when it comes to food, right? And everyone feels that she or he is an expert, because we all know about what f food means in our ethnic um, cultural traditions. Let's see if this works. Yes. Uh, so what I'm going to present a little bit is why focusing on food and eating behaviors among Latinos. You know, Latinos' obesity is a promise. It's called the new epidemics in the United States. Uh, and part of the issue is to understand what is the impact of concept um, acculturation when it comes to why this pattern is continues to happen. Uh, the typical theory in acculturation is that the longer people stay in the United States, the higher the weight is and the worse the health indicators become. So the United States is bad for your health. That will be a take-home message. But the truth is that people change behaviors. It's not being in one place or in another. It is us, as medical anthropologists, public health experts, what we try to understand is what happens to the lifestyles. What are the changes that make people get either healthier or sicker? So what I use uh, is trying to combine models from the social sciences, models that believe in the, the impact of culture, what are the beliefs and practices that people bring from the culture of origin, plus what are the patterns of behavior that people achieve in the countries of destiny. Uh, and by that I mean what kind of jobs people get involved with, uh, how much physical activity they do per week, uh, what lifestyles in terms of how much TV they watch, how much time they spend eating or playing on the street, etc. And I use, in, in terms of conceptual models, I use Bourdieu. Many of you may be uh, familiar, uh, familiarized with the idea of habitus, that we incorporate practices. We, our body gets used to certain tastes, to certain food, to certain smells. And, and the process of migration also is a process of habitus change. We learn to like and we get to apprehend different practices when it comes to food. So I'm going to present a little bit of the, the conceptual model. And I will give you two case studies when it comes to my work on what I call nostalgic foods. That is a term that I wouldn't say I created it, but I will say that I've been one of the um, defenders of these terms. And it's being criticized by the literature to what extent we can combine the idea of nostalgia with the idea of nutrition. And then I will talk about conclusions and implications for research. Uh, so my working hypothesis is that although 
the traditional idea of the acculturation is that people come, it's a little bit simplistic, and with this I'm not saying that I don't use acculturation models. I do use them, particularly in public health. There are two ways in which I use them. One is what we term selective acculturation, which means that people don't just leave one set of cultures and ac achieve and acquire another set. No, that things don't work like this. S things work in transnational ways. People keep practices, combine practices, take, regain, and transform practices. And the second aspect when it comes to acculturation, and now I'm getting warm, um, is that rather than thinking in terms of uh, people abandon practices, food practices, to achieve the bad diet in the United States. What we talk is about a transformation in eating practices. There are certain foods from the culture of origin that are abandoned, others that are retained, and most of the time, others that are transformed in the culture of this, in the place of destiny. So it's not a simple process of acculturation. It's a process through which people with whatever um, goods are out there, whatever, whatever is available to them, are able to reshape the practices. So the working hypothesis that we have here is that while some aspects of traditional diets actually may be protective against obesity and chronic disease, some of the other eating patterns may be harmful, including an excess of fried foods. Keep in mind that I'm biased when I'm presenting this data because I'm really thinking about low-income Latinas in New York City. And you'll see, when you see my data, you will say, this is not representative, this is not real, the power of these samples is very low, this is not really speaking uh, about all the different Latino groups. Look, as an anthropologist, I have problems when, when talking about Latinos, right? As an Argentinian, I don't even uh, eat uh, pastelitos, we eat empanadas. But it's still, there are certain patterns of acculturation and retention that we can see as phenomena that happen across different or, uh, urban groups. So the idea is, and this is a take home message for everyone, sometimes we have few resources, little time, and a lo lots of needs to get, gather data and, and get conclusions. As long as we are modest in terms of the power on the, um, and the extent to which we can exp uh, extrapolate our findings, we can actually find certain connections that our job is to see these connections replicate and, and are being replicated and are being found in other groups. That's what we do. Uh, I'm going to move a little bit fast. I already talked about the idea of acculturation. I'm very, I, again, I'm critical of the term. I think that, that things are not white and black or people don't abandon a practice and take and, and regain or gain new ones. I think this is, the process is very dynamic and we are going to see that in our uh, samples. Why nostalgic foods? Nostalgic inequality is the term I use for this presentation. Nostalgic food, and you can see it here, is a term that is being used first and foremost by the uh, food industry. Usually, if we want to learn what something is trendy, go to the marketing advertisers to see what they are talking about. They are the ones who sell the Goya frijolitos, okay? They are the ones who know what, to, what are the foods that people miss in the diaspora. Are the first one to advertise those food with all the... the additional stuff they put into our traditional food and they sell it to us. The second field that works on the idea of nostalgic food is the field of nost uh, diasporas and migration studies. You'll see fabulous work done around the idea of memory. The anthropology of food is very, very strong in the field of anthropology. We have a strong section in, uh, in the, Amer at the American Anthropological Association that is called Anthropology of Food. And then those interested in ethnonutrition, to what extent different ethnic groups uh, achieve or, or disregard certain eating practic practices and what is that effect on, on, on public health outcomes. I will say that my, my work really crosses all these different lines. And I must say that one little frustration I have when I go out and see what other people are doing, that's why I was so excited when I was invited to come here, is that sometimes our fields have difficulties to speak to each other. When it comes to interdisciplinary work, to really ask the anthropologists, how can we use memory 
to really understand how the memory translates in certain foods that people eat. Or we can ask the public health experts how we can actually measure outcomes in terms of weight gain or weight loss when it comes to understanding what, what people actually retain. So those dialogues are not happening that often. We need those dialogues. We need the pub public health scholars to be aware of the cultural processes that keep make a difference in people's diets. And we need anthropologists to bring down these wonderful conceptual ideas about nostalgia, about uh, culinary retention, and about reproduction of, of, of ethnic beliefs in the diaspora, and see how those ideas actually translate in children's obesity patterns. Hello? So that's my goal, and I'm trying to do that with this kind of research, bringing together different kind of works. Uh, so the term, nostalgic, the term nostalgic foods really refers to the cultural familiar items and recipes, recipes that are prepared, eaten, maintained, and transformed by immigrants and their families in the mainland. And one fascinating um, aspect, and we try to do it with one of our um, projects, is to see to what extent this generational transmission from parents to children is happening or not. How the first generation talks about food and how vis-a-vis -vis the second generation. How the tensions there. To what extent the second generation is re replicating, reproducing, changing certain practices, practices, but also keeping certain pra practices that are harmful to the reproduction of, of the, the, the nutrition aspects. Uh, so basically, what I'm presenting now is two research projects. We're very different. To make a long story short, these were focus group studies that we conducted in 2009, 2010, with different groups of women. You'll see the, the, the samples are really biased towards the Caribbean and Dominicans and the first uh, study, because where the, the population that we had access to in Washington Heights were uh, actually for, uh, from the Caribbean. Uh, but despite all these differences, we try to look at, at similarities. We try to understand the, emo the emotional attachment and consumption, consumption of traditional foods termed as nostalgic foods uh, in comparison to their subjective perceptions of weight gain and body dissatisfactions. Since I don't have much time today, I'm not going to talk about body image, which is huge. We actually did both. We look at food vis-a-vis -vis body image changes and body image dissatisfaction. That will take me another hour. So I'm not going to talk. I'm going to only to talk about the aspect that pertains to nostalgia and nostalgic food vis-a-vis -vis the inequality. So the thesis, the underlying thesis, is that the foods that are being retained by women are connected with the barriers that women encounter when it comes to buying produce and buying foods in New York City. So I'm going to really uh, keep it to that um, extent. So we did individual questionnaires. We did a body shape rating scale. And the questions that we use, th these are the samples. This is the first, the first study you'll see Foreign-born, 70%. From the Dominican Republic, almost 50%. And if you look at the BMI on the bottom of the, of the table, you'll see that between normal and overweight, almost 70% women self-rated themselves as weight and, uh, overweight and obese. Keep in mind also the, bi the intrinsic bias that we have with these samples. When you advertise for people to come to these studies and to be part of your focus groups, many will think that this is a self-help uh, uh, loss weight group, right? I mean, we are paying them modest fees for them to attend, for them to come to, to, to talk to us. So the, the sample itself is going to be biased towards the overweight or obese uh, population. However, and I don't have uh, all the numbers here, what we also do is try to see when we, this is the second group, the second um, study we did in 2010, we saw that there was a correlation between what we got self-reported, remember that it's always self-report bias, people always pretend to be, when they ask you how old you are, we tend to, <laughs> natural to say we're younger, when they ask us how, how much we weigh with naturally, particularly for women, it's hard to be honest with certain questions, particularly when these are, are self-reported 
uh, information. But we are taking this at face value, and again, here our interest was to understand what were the motivations, what was the relation between what people ate and their unhappiness with their own body shape and weight and vis-a-vis -vis the food they consume every day. So the, the main six topics uh, that we use for the focus groups, so methodologically, you, you may ask, so how do you measure the individual versus, I can, I can read your minds already. Basically, what we did, at the same time, when people will come to the focus groups, we, they, we gave them individual questionnaires where they self-rate their age, uh, size, uh, um, the, the, the body scale, et cetera. After they did that, we did the focus group. So that saved us also time and money. We took two, the two measures, the, the two uh, aspect, the um, parts of the study, we did it in one session. We tried to do the individual measures first to avoid having the group discussion influencing and biasing the individual measures. If you look at the literature on focus groups, you learn that there are so many bias when people are in groups, tend to say what is socially expected and or what the leader may um, uh, actually lead to. So all these methods have issues. So what we try to do as social scientists and public health practitioners is try to avoid the bias as much as possible. I have to say, and I will say this at the end, I didn't, I couldn't have done this alone. I work with nutritionists. Uh, most of my research assistants for these two studies were nutritionists, as well as my co PI, who is a nutritionist at the School of Public Health, Hunter School of Public Health, where I used to work. I'm checking the time. Okay, I still have 20 minutes. Uh, so I'm going to be a little bit faster. So these are the questions. No, this was no questions. These were guidelines that we use. And we try, and this is the other thing, you try to follow whatever it comes up from the group. At the same time, you need to keep to make sure that you don't go away from, from the actual um, dimensions you wanted to explore. It's attention. People think that doing focus groups is, hey, piece of cake. It's not. You have to be really trained to make sure that you get, gain data and you learn about new topics, because that's the whole point, while at the same time you retain the main dimensions you want to explore. So one of the things that came out, and this is what I'm going to present now, are the findings from across all the groups that we, we conducted. And one clear finding was that food means emotional attachment. Food among Latinas means family reunions, means emotional bonding, means reproducing the lost land, the, last, uh, the land left behind in the diaspora. So getting together to eat summarizes the symbolic attachment to these ethnic communities. The food, as Cecilia tells us, focus group two, what you see here is the focus group and the study, right? Uh, the food reminded us of the people from your country sitting down to dinners, big dinners with your whole family, and there is a certain meat that is made a certain way, you know, that abuelas, grandmothers, make sopa, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So both among the, the first and the second generation, the whole idea of getting together to eat nostalgic foods it was a big ticket item. And by nostalgic, I mean that most women will talk about making the food as it used to be made. The idea that you are trying to reproduce whatever brings you back to the lost environment. During, and we analyzed different categories. One was the holiday events. People, particularly among the second generation, people do this nostalgic reproduction just for Christmas or for Passover or Easter for certain events. Um, so the association with childhood, with mothers and, and grandmothers who raised them abroad, and they identify those mothers with, with certain culinary traditions. And, and the important thing is that New York, as an ethnic and social space, helps certain communities to actually found physically, physically and socially the reproduction of this nostalgia. You found these little carts or big carts selling pastelitos, selling uh, arepas. New York City and in specific ethnic groups like in Dominican, um, Dominican areas like in Washington Heights, you even have restaurants like in Malecon that are aimed to Dominican, the Dominican immigrants in the area. 
antojitos mexicanos. I don't need to tell you this because you probably know about all this food better than I do. Uh, but the, and again, as I said before, the idea is to find what is common to this reproduction and construction of nostalgia, what, what, what we found. And I will mention two or three key, key take home messages. One is this idea of organic cornucopia. This idea that it's like all pastime was better than the present. Everything at home was better, fresh, rich, pure, abundant with no chemicals. Women across the groups tend to idealize the food they had at home. And by a home, I mean the homeland. So we lab label this as organic cornucopia. And I will show you the, the representation of this cornucopia as, as we found it. The second one, and this second finding, directly relates to the nostalgic um, inequality I want to come back at the end, is what we call the same food paradox. Many women across the groups will tell us that the same food they eat in the United States makes them gain weight, while back home makes them lose weight. If this was my class, and I don't have the time to do this, I will ask you, what do you think these women found the paradox? Maybe we leave that at the end. But this paradox is directly linked to the social injustice and the social inequality that women experience in the United States. They are not lying. They are talking about the same food. What, they are, what this represents, the same uh, food paradox, is actually telling us is that underlying this paradox is are all the barriers and all the lifestyle changes that women experience in the United States vis-a-vis -vis the homeland. So we will come back to that. But I just want to show you this is the, the typical example of the cornucopia. So they talk about pesticide-free foods. They are cheap. People fish. And, and I will show you some quotes so you get an idea, a clear idea of how this was represented. The, the foods are gotten from your own backyard. They are always available, hormone-free, et cetera. So this is the, the beautiful uh, um, image that represents what women actually tell. And by women, I'm talking about women because these studies are done among women. But we did something, a, a similar study that I don't want to talk about this today. We did it with the students, males and females at Hunter College, and we got similar results. But I decided not to bring those because I will need another hour to talk about those. So let's, let's see some examples. So you get the sense, and um, many of you may ask me may, how did that we triangulate, and this is another story, how to use qualitative data when it comes to focus groups. That's why the dimensions that I showed you at the very beginning are a way to pre-categorize certain topics. Once we categorize or, uh, organic carnoscopia as one item, then we start reading the interviews. We use in vivo and other programs to see how this idea of the pure, organically free, chemistry free stuff came up. And this is an example. It's about the fruits and everything. If you don't have it in the backyard, they pass you mango. Uh, the food is healthier there than here. I ate, grew up eating lots of vegetables, lots of fruits, and lots of, of, of fish. And this is one of what that represents the lost paradise, this quote, when she says, when my father was a fisherman, he would bring lots of fish. My mother immediately goes to the farm to change fish for fruit or vegetables. So I always in my house, we ate lots of vegetables and fruit and then fish. This idea is the perfect bartering economy, right? It's almost going back to Marx talking about, in the capital number one, talking about how people will survive. I, I, I get fish from the, the fresh river. I go to the market and exchange it for fruits and vegetables. So perfect, the perfect idea of the, um, the um, na na natural life. Um, but then, after, and this was almost, this dynamic almost follow a natural storytelling. You know that when people talk, naturally, we before we share ideas with others, we have what is called an um, internalized representations of, of our own life history. So not typically during the interviews, people will start with this idea of idealization, idealizing the land they left behind, how wonderful it was, 
And then when we ask them, tell us about what you do today in New York City. How is your life? What are the food you eat? They start telling us about what we call the barriers, in the barriers found in the physical and social environment. So we are not here talking about individual level barriers. We are not here talking about, I have no enough money to buy. The typical thing that came out was the distance to the supermarkets that where they could get the healthier foods, the difficulties they found to get like the platanos they needed to make the platano frito they like, and by social environment also the lack of a, a, avail available ways to get to those places. I come late, my children are hungry, the supermarket where I can get the food is far away, what is the easy to get? Domino's Pizza. So the physical and social environment are combined with the impossibility or the difficulties for many of these women to continue on the one hand making the food. The, 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 the typical reason will say eating healthy and well costs money and time. Two factors that we don't have. That's why the holiday meal was the, was the anti-representation of these barriers. We can do that when we are having a holiday, when we go back home and spend time with our families, when, when, when we are in vacation. But on, on an everyday basis, there is no way we can do that because of these barriers. Another example about the physical environment, you don't find places nearby to buy healthy food. The ant antithesis of this was actually having whole foods where the, the price of organic stuff is too expensive. So it's a catch-22. Either you have the bodega where they couldn't afford, they couldn't find certain items, or you have whole food where you cannot afford them because of the price. Okay, so they, that, that's another thing that came up a lot. And these sentences, for me, it will be the, ch I mean, we're writing many articles about dif the different, because as you can tell, this is, this is a book in itself, right? I mean, so much information here. But this sentence, for me, summarizes everything. To gain weight is cheaper. To lose gain is very exp expensive. And they were talking about in New York City. What is affordable here is junk foods, you know, our bad, uh, um, tasty, nostalgic foods. And they talk a lot about that. And they price your pain. The hormones, I mean, the, the affordable meats are the ones that are, they come with many hormones. They cannot afford buying organic chicken, et cetera. Uh, and it's more of the same, you know? And the idea that buying and eating carbs is a way to get along, get away with being hungry and not wasting time. And one aspect, and I want to go there because I know I don't have much time, is that the, the practice of snacking, which in America is almost like our bread and butter, right? Snacking all day. It's a practice that these women didn't have in the countries of origin. Fixing meals. And here, remember what I said at the beginning, the, the, the same food paradox? Food here, the same food here makes you gain weight, and the same food there, you lose weight. One of the aspects is back home, they didn't snack. Here, of course, they keep the meals. That means that they're eating 10 times more often than back home, although eating, in some cases, the same food. The second aspect related to this is the idea of comfort foods. Food is an emotional pacifier. Okay, because of the stress that, that these women experience, most of these women, if they were not single uh, women, they were actually the breadwinners in the household, they have long hours. And one thing that most, in most cases they, they complain about is the available um, suites that were at the, where, at the places where they work. They have donuts and muffins all the time to munch on. But I said, I don't know why I keep gaining weight. I, I try to go home and eat the vegetable, mean ensalada con carne, M means lean meat and ensalada and salad. Meanwhile, they're munching on carbs all day long. And they were very clear. The other thing I want to mention is we are the, the sociologists and public health practitioners trying to understand what is behind. Women were quite aware of the reasons that made them weight, uh, gain weight. 
It's not that like we were dealing with a population that were like, oh, why is that? And even the paradoxes that I'm mentioning to you, is you'll see in a few seconds that this paradox became very clear to them when they start making distinctions between the lifestyle they had home, back home and the lifestyle they had in the United States. So I'm summarizing what I call the cumulative barriers. Remember I talk about financial barriers, lack of time, the physical and social environment. And this idea of having a concept, the nostalgic food concept is one, which actually uh, interacts with the idea of cumulative barriers. Financial barriers, uh, we live in food swamps and food deserts. What is the difference? Many, the, the, the idea of the food desert was the original one that we don't have. We are in a desert of food. No. My ar last article, I actually talk about food swamps, and I'm not the first one talking about that. That is not the lack of food. It's the oversupply of unhealthy food, the problem that we're dealing with. Okay, So this is what happened in New York. And the life constraints, because of the financial barriers and the physical and social environment barriers, these women are complaining about lack of time for shopping and cooking. They are, they are subject to what we call the triple shift. They are working, studying, and raising children. They skip meals in the US due to busy schedules and the snacking that I just referred to. And if we compare, um, to what they talk about in the United States vis-a-vis uh, -vis the homeland, in most cases, they will refer to the fact that back home, and I, give a, I have in mind two or three women who will talk about walking instead of taking public transportation when they are in the Dominican Republic, keeping fixed meals, which means that the heaviest meal is in the morning, vis-a-vis -vis what happens in the United States. They work all day. When they come home hungry, the heaviest meal is at night, and in the evening. And they, they, are, they don't snack in between, and they do physical activity in ways they don't do here. Guess what? What would women from the Caribbean do in, 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 in ways that they don't? Dancing. And that's another thing for us as public health practitioners to keep, keep into account. When we talk about physical activity, we don't often consider that dancing in a dance hall, walking, and you know, is also a very important aspect, physical activity that, that people do outside of the urban environment, being in parks. One of the complaints that women have, particularly in certain areas in Dominican Heights, was uh, Dominican Heights, Washington Heights, that was awful what I just said. <laughs> terrible, terrible. Oh, oh, how could I? Is that I don't let my children to play outside. One of the groups that came out of this study is the walking ladies. They created, because as I said, many women came to, this, to, to our, our groups looking for help. And one fear they had is that they didn't want to walk in the morning alone. Uh, so they created one of my research assistants with a physical therapist, created the Walking, morning, walking Latinas Network. So they will get together, go to work at 6 o'clock in the morning as a group. So they will feel safe. Um, so just to finish the whole thing, because it's a lot to say, and I don't want to overwhelm you, and forgive me because I'm missing lots of stuff, is that women were quite aware of the, the detrimental and the healthy parts of the nostalgic attachment to the ethnic foods. It's not that they were not. And many of them were talking at the end, and remember we had different dimensions that we, we developed throughout the groups. They were talking about how to make different foods in a way that, that are still nostalgic, but bring more justice and inequality and gain weight, uh, gain, gain lost. And they're saying, you don't have to give up your food. It's just eating in moderation, using different kinds of oils, uh, trying to stay, instead of using red meat, use tofu. So because we will ask them, tell us how will you make a difference in the food that you and your grandma uh, make make every day in a way for you to be able to lose weight. Because a lot of the complaint, particularly among the second generation, was how can I lose weight if a still mama makes the same tamales con chiles and make me fat? And it's very hard not to eat those because I come late from, from work and I'm hungry. Finding substitutes, 
women talk about it. One idea that we had and we couldn't develop at that point because we need more money is how to develop recipe books that are respectful of the nostalgic um, items women have, but have ingredients that are less uh, heavy in sodium and fat, etc. That's another, you know, take home message for the future. So just to summarize, and now I know, I know that I have, what, five minutes before the Q&A, is that what we found um, across these uh, this studies is what we call the double effect of nostalgic foods on participants' eating patterns. So what participants tend to, to retain is items that are high, cal uh, high caloric food, and they counterbalance them with fruit and vegetables. But the migration process strengthens the first and weakens the second. I want to make clear, it's not that these women say we don't need uh, arroz uh, with ensalada, rice with salad. They do. It, it, this, the, the, the numbers of, or, of tropical foods these women had it's incredible, you know, papaya, mango, etc. What happens is that those healthy items are being, slowly, they are being replaced by what? Cookies, muffins. Easier, cheaper, easy to eat, you're on the bus, you're on the train, you, you just eat very fast. The second aspect is this organic cornucopia, the idealization of the homeland. In many cases, people say, hey, give me a break. Monsanto has taken over all the Caribbean. I agree with you. But this idealization is more than believing in uh, fairy tales. This idealization is actually a way for these women to convey a past that they don't, no longer have. This idea that of having a healthier lifestyle, perhaps they were poor, Perhaps they couldn't go to college, but they were not. And, and actually, an example is that many of these women say that when they go back on vacation, they lose weight back home, which is even more contradictory, right? And when you ask them, why is that? They tell you, yeah, because I go dancing every week. I'm not that anxious. Anxiety and comfort foods are like a bread and, and peanut butter, right? We hear the tendency to control our anxiety is possible through what? Cookies, you know, sugar. So women, because the lifestyles is more relaxed back home, not necessarily because the foods are better, but be, and because also they have access to certain foods that are cheaper there and then here. They say, we eat more fruits when we're at home. We have more time to actually cook certain foods that we don't have the time to, to cook here. So this idea of losing weight when at home while eating the same foods is really I would say is the symptoms of this nostalgic inequality that I referred at the beginning of the uh, presentation. Uh, so keeping in mind the structural barriers have an impact on lifestyle changes. People change lifestyles depending on the social and, and, and uh, labor circumstances. This idea uh, replacing healthy choices for comfort foods. And keep in mind uh, the idea that People are not here or there. More and more, we are, we are here and there. People Skype, people travel. The old-fashioned idea of the, and I have nothing against assimil assimil assimilation theories. You know them as well as I, I know. I'm not going to mention any of my colleagues. The idea that people will leave a culture, come to any culture, leave the, 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 the life they have behind, no longer exists. People go back and forth. We Google about what's going on in one place or another. So this dynamic flow between people coming and going has a very clear impact. Many of these women actually bring the rice from home, believe it or not. And people actually keep changing practice and bringing new practices back to the United, the, from the United States back home. We are actually exporting the obesogenic epidemics to the rest of the world today. Look what's happening in Mexico. They have the highest rate of consumption of cola in Latin America, all the cola product, products. Uh, so this transnational linkage is important to keep into account when it comes to how we're going to face the epidemics of the 21st century, which is the obesity, uh, ob um, obesity epidemics. You see that more and more we see c cases of children, I don't know if you have seen in the news, babies uh, with weights that we had never seen before, and we are talking about ethnic children, children from Colombian, 
heritages and uh, children from Asian heritages, ways that we never experienced before. Why is that happening? And it will continue to happen unless we start considering both from a public health pers perspective and from a sociological perspective on what are the alternatives to keep traditions alive, but on the other hand, to make sure that um, the deleterious practices don't become part of the new traditional uh, cells. So there are many ways to do this. Health, uh, the, I mentioned some before. I talk about healthy recipes. Uh, um, the idea, I, I talk also about selective acculturation, about healthy messages that don't need to ostracize and, and vilify nostalgic uh, foods and traditional foods, just the, op just the opposite. Keep in mind that interventions need to be family oriented. The idea that, and you know this, you are, many of you are community health practitioners. The idea that the individual is the unit of analysis when it comes to food no longer works. If there is something that we still tend to share is food. So thinking about, and by family, I even talk about the family of, of college students. What are the students eating on this campus? They are a family in their own way. So thinking about how to, how to target groups and populations, the idea of ethnic marketing. One of the, of the initiatives that worked quite, quite well for a while was the Healthy Bodegas Initiative. The Department of Health was trying to actually encourage bodegas. Bodegas are the grocery stores in Hispanic neighborhoods. They were trying to really encourage those to buy low-fat meal, to bring more vegetables, et cetera, et cetera. The green cards, the issue of the green cards is a big problem in low-income uh, neighborhoods. We have them in the, up, uh, the Upper East Side. We have them in, uh, in Forest Hills. We don't have them in many uh, places where, you know, the unhealthy epidemics is overspread. And expanding the conceptual framework, ideas as food oppression. I feel really bad I won't be staying today until the end of this conference. Many of my colleagues are going to be addressing these issues. And again, the idea of food oppression, social inequalities are reflected, are vivid, are not theoretical, conceptual metaphors out there. We are experiencing every day in the things we eat, in the air we breathe, in the time we have to, to, to share meals, to share time with others. So keep in mind those. And as I said, uh, we need to come up with better messages, you know, catchy messages, um, accentuating the fun and the benefits associated with the food people and immigrant communities eat. Uh, I'm going back now. And I want to acknowledge before I finish, this is one of my graduate assistants, uh, Barbara Tagliaferro. We have been presenting this um, body of work. I'm saying body of work because I didn't have the time today to talk about body image. Barbara is now uh, revising uh, an article based on our work together uh, for Appetite. Appetite is, is one of the highest ranked journals in the food uh, and cultural studies. And this is another example of what we're doing with nostalgia. We put uh, things that you can do in your classrooms. One of my classes is about research design. We, we train our students to do studies on this, their own families about food and nutrition. They did all their histories with their families. And out of that, it came an amazing multimedia show where the participants came to tell their stories vis-a-vis -vis, uh, showing, this was, a, this was City Corp in Long Island City. We had an amazing exhibit. We got uh, funding from Citibank, I must say. Uh, we sold ourselves to the enemy, but they supported, and now they were developing intervention practices. So we can do this in the classroom. Our students can be their own ethnographers in their own communities, and they all carriers of way of doing things different among themselves. So I thank you. This is to show you my own nostalgic food market. There is a supermarket in Queens. These are the foods I buy. This is the Argentinian flag there, there's here. And I go there to get my nostalgic foods. And here it is, the before. And I'm, on, I'm a vegetarian. I don't eat meat. But I go and I buy the nostalgic food that, that my people love, which is meat. The before, and this is the dessert, and this is the after. They're together. I'm together with my friends. So that tells you how important food is. Even for a vegetarian who doesn't eat meat, the idea of buying meat, cooking meat, and getting my below people to eat the meat that I don't eat makes me 
happy. So unless we understand the emotional effects of food, we are not going to be, be able to make many differences when it comes to changing behavior. So thank you very much for inviting me to be here. I look for, forward to your questions. And I will pass around. I'm expecting to be promoted, so I don't have my, la my latest um, card with me, but I will be happy to give you my email uh, address, and, and you can contact me if you, ha you, you have questions about the work that we continue to be doing at Queens College. Thank you very much. So is there questions or comments? Um, should I? I am. You, you, you. There's a microphone here if anybody wants to and there is be official. Or not. You can just stand up. Otherwise, I keep talking. <laughs> That's not a problem. Yes. And please, it, 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 tell me your name and your major, your nostalgic food. Like? My name is Janaidi. I'm a history major and public health minor. I'm Dominican. And my question is, do you think as long as we try to continue to gain what we lost? Because I'm, I'm first generation here. So I know my mom's always cooking food from over there and I try to replicate it, but then I also try to Americanize it at the same time. So you think as long as I keep on trying to find the Dominican parts in food, I will, if we will always continue to be stuck I'm relating to like the cornucopia. Oh, it's so cute. What do you think? What is your feeling? I have answers, but I would like to know what is your feeling? What is your, are you struggling with that now? Because your mom makes certain foods and you would like to make changes? Because, you know, you feel like in between? Yeah, I feel in between. Like, I don't wanna. This is what, I'm doing. Research now. <laughs> I think as I do feel stuck because I do want to keep on eating the food from there, but then at the same time I want to, like I'm learning how to cook, so I want to learn how to cook other things too. But I'm stuck in between. So I don't want to like choose. Welcome, welcome to the world. <laughs> Actually, one thing, you live at home now? Yes. Okay, so negotiate with Nana. I will say, you know, things take time. Uh, I will say, there are no one right or wrong. Being in between is what many of us do. We learn to live in between, and it's fabulous to live. <laughs> you have something that people who don't live in between don't have. It's great to, to be able to do one thing one day and the opposite. And one thing I didn't have time to talk about today, it, because I'm trying to do this within, within 45 minutes, is that it's not true that we are eating the same thing. In one of the slides, you, you, you will see that when we talk about memory, we're really talking about the present. We reinvent memories. The food that mama may be cooking today may have nothing to do with what grandma used to make. And you see that in the literature that people say, this is not the right way to make the tamales. And mama would say, of course, this is the way we make it in, in my country. No, but this is not the way I make it in my country. So the idea of authenticity, or what is right or wrong, is really, again, an emotional concept. So. Just negotiate. My, my answer is always negotiate and don't feel churned because you will find you will find your own way to pass your own interpretation of your own tradition to your friends and to you, your future family. We'll see. But it's lovely to hear from, from you guys because you have experiences at home. And you have this I have this tension when I go back to Argentina and they make a barbecue for you and you're expected to eat meat. Mm -hmm. And they feel insulted when you don't eat meat. Mm -hmm. So I had to come up with original, creative ways to make it believe, you know? Uh, potato, roasted potato, you know? And, and things like that. Any other comment? Yes. Um, well, you mentioned. You are? Uh, Tyler. Hi, Tyler. Uh, uh, I've got to speak into the mic. So. <laughs> um, you mentioned. Uh, I'm an exercise science major. Um, you mentioned like when Latinos come from their homelands here that they tend to gain weight. Uh, and you mentioned like different factors as in like even if they're eating the same foods, they still gain weight and then snacking on like muffins and stuff. But what do you think is like the major factor for the weight gain? Is it what maybe what we have in our food here compared to 
not being as fresh or more chemicals maybe or is it the factor that they're snacking on not fruits and vegetables but on those muffins and the processed foods that are so easily available here because that's just the way of life I will do the same. What do you think? But I will tell you right away, all of the above. It's no, and the challenge we have, and this, that's when this is difficult, there are two challenges. Number one, not to put all Latinos in the same category. Because people have, in some cases, maybe it's, they're snacking all the time. In other cases, it may be eating, and not doing any physical activity. In other cases, it may be really abandoning because you know part of this idea to, to merge and to become American is, okay, I'm going to eat American foods. So we cannot generalize. We really, that's why we get paid to, to do studies and trying to understand, even within the Dominican groups, there are difference between the first generation and the second generation. And uh, your colleague just mentioned one. I'm, I'm, I don't eat the same food that my mom does. Right? So what are the factors that I'm exposed to in terms of becoming obese that may be different from the ones that my mom? But again, what do you think in your practice, right? What, do, what are the aspects? And this is a question, if we have more time for us to work as a group, to start asking ourselves, what are the, 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 the factors that in our everyday life are impacting on our overweight tendencies? What is yours? I mean, I definitely agree with you that it's, a factor of everything, you know, a little bit of everything had like, I know our food has a lot more chemicals and pesticides in it than possibly other countries or other regions. Um, and then also snacking, it's a lot easier for us to snack on the processed foods, you know, the baked goods and stuff because they are cheaper yeah. and they're more uh, available, easily available to us and here. Tasty, right? Yeah. You feel good. The, the, the emotional need to feel good. It's so easy when you, you put a cook in your mouth. Like you don't I, have to peel it off, right? It's just good. I know. I, I just went for breakfast. I just bought an apple for a dollar, but they had a bag of chips for 75 cents. So cost is obviously another thing. It's just it's a lot more expensive, like you were saying, to buy those healthier foods to stay lean. But uh, I think the major thing is lifestyle, really. Mm -hmm. The lifestyle here is just so different. Like like I was saying, like it's just easier to pop open a bag of chips than peel an orange. Absolutely. So. It doesn't smell. Let's imagine with the yeah, tangerines that I love, and everybody smells. It's true, and it's complex. I, I, what I try to do today is not to show you solutions. We have lots of work to do. Do. And, and as I said, you guys, this this conference is a step forward to creating, to building a community of scholars. I would say in the New York uh, the metropolitan area, for us to start working together and addressing these issues because it's it's in our backyard. It's really affecting all of us, our children, our family, us, as we're growing older, even. For those of us who say, oh, I'm not overweight, we're always struggling, and struggling with bad lifestyles. Not, not, not doing enough exercise, not eating fast, you know, having, etc. All the dramas associated with this food. Any comments? Any other solutions? What can we do in this society to make, and, and, and this campus? To, and this is something that happens at Queens. People are thinking, we had to ban a few vendors because of the food they were bringing to come. We're trapped, right? That's the other thing. The physical environment is a captive environment. We eat whatever is available. You had a question or a comment? Yes. I just had a comment. And you are? My name is Juliana. Um, I'm a graduate student here in the communications department. I, but my family, we come from Colombia, and we have a Colombian restaurant here in New Jersey, and I'm always like arguing with my dad because his por the portions are huge. Oh. And I'm like, Bobby, well, why are you eating this much? Why are we feeding people this much? And he's like, oh, but that's why they come to the restaurant for the prices. They're so low. And, and you can eat a lot. Like the bandeja paisa, which is, it's a meal in itself. It's about 1,500 calories in one dish. <laughs> like, have that for breakfast and don't have anything else. <laughs> Just kidding. But um, my biggest thing is, so the food that we buy for the restaurant is healthy. A lot of it... Um, my dad's very particular about what he uses in it, but I think the biggest mistake is the portion control. And it's also because he says, well, that's not the demand that my customers 
are looking for. So I'm giving them what they want, which leads me to believe that there needs to be more education on portion control. Not so much, so perhaps he might not change that, but as a customer, you won't eat all of it. Instead, you'll take it home. Does he put the calorie, the number of calories? No, but that's, a, that's because, another you know, thing. I have to, but the thing is that your dad may be... <laughs> not yet. Not yet. But you know, when you go even to Starbucks, let's be honest, you need a cafecito at Starbucks, and you see muffins 350 calories, right? And then you see the little uh, <laughs> almonds for 150. That, but your dad may be concerned about losing customers if he does that, right? I mean, it also it's also because we're in this capitalistic yeah, um, market, so. And it's my mom is actually she's a she's um, becoming a holistic practitioner, so we're we're trying to pave the way in there. We're bringing in juicing, and so it's it's like a different market um, where the restaurant is located. But we're we're trying. Holistic Colombian food. Yes. <laughs> what about that? That'd be really fun. Come here and lose weight. <laughs> great point. Great, great. I think it's twelve, right? I think that. Time is up. Thank you so much for being here.